show all these flip sheets from those guys. Okay. And we'll go through this just quick, kind of line by line, what their reminders are for this time of year. So, um, the first thing is if you want to take loads out on your drain that's sitting in the bins, March 31st is the last day to take your drain load out on last year's crop. Um, and then May 31st, that's for wheat, barley, and canola. And May 31st will be your final day for your deep well and mustard that well in the case so, and then it says loans are taken over a week to disperse oftentimes, so make sure if you need a drain loan to do that right away. Their NAP deadline is the same deadline as what we have for the federal crop. So if you're going to grow a crop that's not insurable to us, that's where NAP fits, right? That'd be like that annual forage stuff that you guys might be doing, like some forage barley or something that would fit into that NAP category. You have until March 15th to get signed up in there for that if you want that insurance. You're not required to do that anymore, so if you just want to grow it uninsured, that's fine. It, it used to be great. So, and then, um, if you're doing any new breaking of any amount of land, which pertains to both us and them, right, you need to first come in to the office and complete a form and also let us know. If you don't do that, you could lose all that PLC money and we don't want that to happen, right? So, and then, please remember if you're changing your farm operation in any way or changing members in an entity, you come in and see them. And then so your spring maps, if you're, you're a tool county person, are sitting there at the office just waiting for you guys to pick up, and they are done, actually. So you can stop in there and grab those two. The PLC Arctic sign up, you can't switch programs anymore, right? But that's just saying you want to be in it again for another year. So you have to have that done by August. That would be for 2018, it looks like. And managed grading and CRP starts March 15th, it looks like. And so that's the FSA portion of this. We're going to get um, eventually rolling into the crop insurance stuff, but we're going to make sure the clickers work first, of course. So how much native slide can be broke out without the FSA on this thing? Five acres? Two acres? None, or I don't need my government money. If you don't need your government money, you can do whatever you want, right? <laughs> Hopefully this works because my clicker thing was messed up here. We'll give it a second. Cool. So that's perfect. There used to be a five acre exemption with somebody quick. Now there is no more five acre exemption anymore. It's actually done. So if you're going to break any native song out at all down to a tenth of an acre, you have to let it know, right? If not, you have to go through a bunch of committee stuff and explain why they did that and they couldn't take your funding away. But there's one rich person in your rich. And then complete your checklist and pick your levels. Obviously, that'll be part of that. 
And then we'll take you through after the break. We have a bunch of R test plots that we do with like crop rotations and what our results ended up being and kind of what we're going to do this next year and why. And then there's a bunch of Canadian research stuff that I found that's really cool in there too that we can go through on summer fall versus not situation. So, so do you plan to feed peas, chickpeas, lentils, or lentils this year? Basically, are you going to see the pulse crops? The ones that yes, twos, and no, and trees and undecided. This just helps us know what the stress here is in this presentation. So that's pretty awesome. I think in summers it was more like a 50-50 thing, but when we get to the phasing out summer fall thing, that's a really important piece of that, right? I think. So these are your base prices here for this coming crop here. Let's zoom in on that. We have winter wheat was set last fall, right, at 508. All the rest of these, the average is virtually done, so they're not going to hardly change from this. This is the last day in our average. So spring wheat, 631 a bushel. It's really pretty good. The big one is Durham, which is weird because open market Durham's about six bucks, right, or something right now. Five eighty-five. Five eighty-five, right, for open market. So for some reason, crop insurance has that egg to seven eleven a bushel. Plus, you guys that are in Tool County, especially, they raise the Durham County average yield a whole bunch, which we'll get into here when we get to the next slide. So a really good opportunity. It's almost comparable to kind of what the chippy thing was for us here, especially in Tool County. Um, canola's 18.4 cents, which I think equates back to like nine bucks a bushel, I think. And then barley's 3.28, but you can put your barley contract on top of that if you're going to go farther, right? So if you're not, if you're on a barley contract, though, you're guaranteed it's going to be based off based off that three dollars and twenty eight cents. The pulse crop things they should release any day now. There's no way to track those as they go along because there's just some person sitting in the RNA office that's calling these elevators. And get their settlements every day for the month of February, basically. They don't send us reports or anything. So I'm guessing these off of about where the contracts are at right now for the open dot or uh, after dot one. The yellow pea is probably 11 cents. That's what they've been for quite some time. The small kabuli is probably 25 cents and the largest 34. So those are probably going to come in almost as high as last year, right? I think. But the one that's going to drop is levels because the level market just kind of tanked here a little bit. That's still historically slightly above average for lentils when I look at the chart, which is not as good. It's like we were at the $15 wheat level on pulses, right? We need to adjust back to normal and everything. So, so the chickpea thing's still really good. You're going to see as we get into it, the level's not probably quite as good as far as the guarantee goes on the pulses. You guys, if you look in your packets there, let's go back. This sheet is in your packet too. That's that cross rotation sheet I was talking about. So if you find something that looks like that, I'll kind of explain how to use this, just so you don't have any misunderstanding. It's pretty self-explanatory, I think, but if you pick on that sheet at the top what you plan to see this year in any given field, this will give you how many years break you need from those other crops on the left-hand side. Does that make sense? So like if we look at lentils, and then we look down to chickpeas, how long of a break do we need? We couldn't have had chickpeas last year, right? If we're going to see lentils this year. Does that make sense? But all you need is a one-year break. Look at chickpeas, though. What's the only thing you need a break from on chickpeas? <laughs> chickpeas, right? Which is weird, isn't it? You can literally put chickpeas on top of peas if you want to. Whatever. It's just the way that the insurance rules are set up there. So if you screw up and you don't give yourself a long enough break between, like, peas back to peas, it's not like they're going to penalize you or anything. That Those acres will just be on the shirt. Right? So the other acres of your peas will be fine that, that are within the rotation correctly. It's, it's just the ones that are not won't be insured, basically. They'll get reported as uninsured acres. So. so which rotation on here isn't insurable? We've got peas, wheat, chickpeas, peas, chickpeas, wheat, lentils, wheat, lentils, or mustard, peas, wheat. I'll give you a little bit of time to figure that out. At first glance, it almost looked like all of those shouldn't be, right? But then now we got wheat in there. So wheat would be one year break in there. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Uh, two, two, two years. <laughs> I know, right? It takes a little bit of thinking. 
think I figured this would get you guys used to that sheet as to which that over is. Like, so. One of those in there we can't do because there's not a long number in here, right? <laughs> so, the right answer, which we'll roll on, is lentils, wheat lentils. And you guys, can you see why that is, actually? So, to go back to lentils, there has to be how long of a break? Two years, right? The peas, wheat, chickpeas is fine because all you care about is when you want to see the chickpeas, right? And then the, the peas, chickpeas, wheat is fine because you can literally put chickpeas on top of peas. And the mustard, peas, wheat, that's fine because that, there's no restrictions on the peas where the mustard stuff will support, right? If I did, that's fine, right? So we'll see how the people who answered it. Cool. You guys did real good, actually. It doesn't seem like the peas, chickpeas, wheat should, should be insurable, but it's, it's just what it is. Um, in 2019, that's going to change. They were going to try and change it for 2018, but a bunch of farmers, especially in eastern Montana, already have bought their seed, and so the farm groups lobbied to get this pushed a year out. So right now, you can see like I said, peas, wheat, lentils, wheat, peas, because they're considered different types. You just keep rotating back and forth. Now peas and lentils be considered the same thing for your rotation purpose, basically, whether it's a pea or a lentil. So it'd have to be like peas or lentils, and then two-year break, and then peas or lentils. Like you couldn't, you couldn't do peas here, wheat, and then lentils anymore. Does that make sense? You'd have to have a two-year break between it because they're considered the same crop for rotation. You'd, you'd still be able to do like lentils, wheat, chickpeas, wheat. Correct. Because then, yeah, if you did that, like lentils, wheat, chickpeas. So then you could have a two-year break in there. You literally could go back to peas or lentils in it that way. Or back, or back to wheat, and then you wave the pea farmer up. Obviously, from a disease standpoint, it's probably not too good to stack a pulse every other year in their anyways, right? But but they can do it right now, you just won't be able to in 2019 just start planning if that's what you're looking at doing. So. so each one of these crops has an earliest seeding date, which this year probably won't be a problem, right? <laughs> Sometimes it would be. So wheat barley is one of the big ones. Barley growers like to get in there in March if they can. If for some reason that barley comes up and you see it in March, what do you think happens? I mean, it might freeze. I mean, it's a possibility. If it's somehow crusted in, that would go freeze. And, and you had to reseed it, they won't give you the replant payment. You can seed it as early as you want. It will be insurable as long as it makes it through that initial establishment point. But if you want the replant payment, if this stuff fails, that's where it is. So, canola and mustard, they're really picky on because they're so susceptible to frost, right? Like, if it comes up, you can wipe it out. So, that's April 15th for those. And then peas and lentils, we can start on March 25th. I don't know if I've ever had a claim on either peas or lentils or wheat and barley because of frost. It's usually because they crust in and real meat around here, right? But the canola, yes, it does happen on sometimes. So. And it could happen. If it got big enough, it could freeze off too. It's so quick. The wheat and barley. The latest date you can see that is May 31st, so this might be more pertinent to this year. And then the canola and mustard, you only get a one month window to see those before they start to penalize you on the canola and mustard. So that ends May 15th. And then the peas have two separate dates, which will pop up here. The smooth peas and Austrians are May 15th, that's because they're a cooler season pulse, I guess. And then the chickpeas and lentils, they tolerate that later seeding a little better, so they normally May 20th. If we get this far out into their if we start seeding in May, then we want to start watching these dates because you're going to start penalizing your coverage, right? If we get past that. If you get more than 20 days past that, then they really whack you. Like, they're going to take it down to what your preventive plant payment would be. If you get that far past, if we get all the way past May 31st and we're 10 days into that, that's where you guys can start thinking about doing that preventive plant thing, right? Yeah. But we hope we don't have to deal with that. Paying for everything. So, then there's also an end of the insurance frame. What this means is that if your crop's still sitting out there on October 31st for your wheat and barley, technically we've hit the end of your insurance. So you should have them come out and appraise it at that point. They'll tell you how many bushels are there, and then whatever happens after that's kind of your baby, more or less, right? Sometimes the adjusters or the companies will work with us on that a little bit, but where this really comes into play is that these smooth peas and the lentils, their end of insurance is September 30th. If you're still harvesting out into October and you forget to turn the claim in on that for us, you only get 
15 days after the end of the insurance period, roughly, to turn the claim. And if you forget about that, then it's a late file claim, and they're getting really, really picky on payments. Also, it ends at the last day that you were harvesting these, technically, the end of your insurance period for that crop. Does that make sense? So, if you finish cutting your peas July 30th, and you wait until you're done with harvest on all the rest of these crops to turn the claim in, eventually they're not going to pay those anymore. They have been. They've just been submitting some paperwork, but the government's getting so picky on that that we're just going to be out of luck. So, if you think you have a claim, turn it in. This is the moral of the story, right? And then sign up on it later. It's way easier to do that than to do these late claims. Neo metals are a really cool crop as far as quality adjustment goes. This takes a lot of the risk out of growing these. So if the peas and lentils are in U.S. number two or less, <coughs> they will dock your total production by taking the number two or less price and divide it into what you should have got had they been number one. So here's a quick example. <coughs> your lentils for number ones are worth 25 cents a pound. At the end of you go to all these in or you got them sampled at the bin and they graded number threes. So they're only going to give you 15 cents a pound because they're threes now, right? So they're going to take the 10,000 bushels we cut in this example. They're going to divide the number three price into the number one. So they're going to say we got 60% of the price we should have got had they been number ones. So they're only going to count instead of 10,000 bushels in this scenario, 6,000 for your claim. And that's better for you, right? For you. Right. So, so that basically, it compensates you dollar for dollar for what you're getting docked at the elevator as far as the pricing goes. So way different than wheat and barley, right? There's so many scenarios where you get docked on that and we don't compensate you. The false crops aren't that way. The one way that this could not work out for you is if you do large kabuli chickpeas and they end up being small. That's not a quality factor at the USDA. So you won't get that reduction for that. That's your risk. And that's another part of the big reward, big risk thing with those big chickpeas, right? So. Everything else will pretty much will pay for. So, the importance of where your land is, if you're in Liberty County or Glacier County, your T-yields are the same for the whole county. But in and Ponderay, too, you have those same T-yields. In Tool, there's map areas, right? So depending on where your land is, you start with better yields. So here's just an example in Tool County. Map area 5 is up here. This is north of the 9 mile, right up in there. Our farm is right here. You can see the fields. We're in area 3. So just five miles down the road, you're going to see how much different the difference the guarantee is on some of these crops. So like the large Kukuli chickpeas in Tool County with our estimated price of 34 cents, your guarantee up by the hills is 361 bucks an acre, which I can zoom in on this. We're going to get into some optimistic stuff for the twos and threes guys here too on the dirt up here. But 361 bucks in area five in Tool County, 366 bucks. In Ponderay County, and if you go up to area three, where Wendy and I are at, just down the road, we lose $140 an acre in guarantee start now. Right? That's a lot of money. This part is, uh, that's what the profit's at in there. When we figure that out on our projections, we're probably going to just barely break even, right? At the hills, you're going to make money with that, or you should. So, so, big deal if you're picking up new land or something, see where that map area is. The one thing you really don't want if you pick up new land, in general, is stuff in this AAA. Because that's called high risk. And your guarantee to add on those chickpeas, instead of being 220 bucks, one buck is going to be like 80. And your premium is going to be twice as much, basically. So that is just a function of where they drew those lines a lot of times. Most of that's right around some range lines or something. So, so this is a big deal for Jewel County. They didn't change this for Ponderay, but they did for Glacier some. Um, the Durham yields look at this like in map area two and three for summer full of Durham in one year. If you have never done Durham before, last year you would have started with 22 bushels, now you start with 37. Right? Isn't that crazy? Well, like, I don't know who came up with this nonsense, but it's in there, and they can't change it for a year, so that's good. It's a lot of I don't know, look at Area 5. You come down to this Area 5 up by the hills, recrop Durham, starting yield 38 bushels an acre on there, right? Times 7 11 a bushel. So, you figure that out. I mean, that's probably 300 bucks an acre up there at the hills for drinking. Yeah. So, so, what's neat though about that is for you guys that are trying to cash all stuff at the bank, if you're in this yeah. two and three and you have some summer so you need to start with a 37 bushel yield up here on Durham, right? Nine, seven bucks a bushel. So, I mean, that, I was just thinking around this and I found that in the actual word. I said, wow, this doesn't seem right. You'd think somebody would have caught that. They did. So, for one year, at least we get to use these yields. If not longer, hopefully. So. so this is your area two and three Durham guarantee. 
This just shows the enterprise versus optional units on here. It's about eight bucks an acre for optional, and like about five bucks for an enterprise. And then look at the guarantee. This is for that map area three, which is where our farm is, right? This is real great land. As far as that goes, it went from 105 bucks last year. Between the price change and the yield change this year, it goes up to almost 200 bucks an acre. Right? So, pretty cool for a crop that doesn't cost a whole lot more than spring wheat to grow, probably. But enterprise units on the peas and the lentils, they can result in a huge reduction in your premium on the pulses, but they're going to throw all your pulse tags together into one big pot before it pays out. Does that make sense? Because if you do lentils and peas um, and chickpeas all on the same farm, they're going to take your chickpea guarantee and then add in your lentil guarantee and add in the smooth pea guarantee, and you'll have one big number you need to get below before they start paying the claim. <coughs> this is an example. Your lentils are forty thousand dollars above a claim. Your smooth peas ended up at fifty thousand below when they worked your claim here. Your total loss payment in the enterprise units would be the fifty thousand dollar loss subtracted by the forty thousand dollar gain on the lentils, basically, or it's just a ten thousand dollar loss payment there. So why would anybody do that? Obviously, with this next slide, kind of explain that, but there's a huge difference in premium. So, so we want to make sure we cover this because every year we get. To harvest time, and somebody says, Well, I didn't remember you were going to throw my lentils together with peas, and we cover this every meeting, right? So, on top of this, we have a disclaimer to sign. You can't sue us for whatever that is. <laughs> so, if you will let enterprise units on your pulse crops, it will put all of my pea types together into one guarantee for all acres I see in that count. The true or false. So, one is true, two is false. And I hope you guys get 100 of this. Anyway. <laughs> And that is my county, at least, like it says up there. So, <clears throat> so cool. You most of you did pretty good. Did you? The 18 percent person, those are going to be the two people that say, I don't remember what you told me. <laughs> Does it change by practice? It would change by practice between irrigated and non-irrigated. Oh, right. Yeah, so that's right. You could elect that. That's EP instead of EU if you put that in an enterprise unit by practice, and then then it would separate those two out. Yeah. If you left EU on your policy, you would put it all together. To do, so. And the discount's the same either way. So here's the premium difference on those pulse crops. I'm gonna zoom in here so you can see this, hopefully. So it's 75% on these large Kabuli chickpeas, which is a big guarantee thing, right? So our guarantee is probably 260 bucks an acre in this example. 16 bucks an acre if it's an enterprise unit, but it's 40 bucks an acre in optional. So that's a lot, right? I, nobody wants to pay 40 bucks an acre, I don't think. But, so that's why it'll end up getting thrown together. And what we're trying to get, which we'll get to on another slide here, the great big farms to do is at least split up into a couple different entities. It just takes more paperwork. But each entity would have its own set of enterprises. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. So, so if enterprise unit qualifiers, you have to have 20 or more acres of any pea type in two or more sections. So like in this example, we can see 80 acres of peas here. And let's say we wanted to try lentils, so we went down the road and see the 20 acres of lentils in another section. That would qualify because full types are getting thrown together anyway. It doesn't have to be two sections of peas, technically, but it has to be more than 20 acres here. So what happens if we only see 15 acres in this other section? You guys know? They revert you back to optional units, so then you pay a 30 bucks an acre, right? All because of the 15 acres instead of the 20. So it's really, really important to make sure you see 20 acres somewhere else. Or it can be an acre dip, like section 1 and 3 here are 10 acres a piece, and they can add up to 20 on top of there if you want. So, so if you're going to do a crop like that, or a crop like no one, if you're going to see 400 acres in one section somewhere, it definitely pays to drive somewhere and see 20 more acres if you can work it out, right? Because we can get you the enterprise versus the optional. Very little risk difference in there. As far as the multiple entity advantage, if you split your operation into multiple operators at the FSA, you'll be able to split your land up by the policy. So you can now see all your chickpeas in one entity and your lentils on another, for example. The thing is, though, at the FSA, They've got a bunch of requirements for you to qualify as having, I don't remember what they call it exactly, but it's like financial risk of the entity or whatever. You couldn't just go out and set up an LLC, not lease equipment back from the other entity, 
or at least some land back and just run the, the gray tail through the LLC. That, that wouldn't qualify in that area, you wouldn't get your DLC on there. Does that make sense? So if you're going to do it, make sure you know what the heck you're doing, right? Or whatever, but it could be a big deal. Like our, our farm's not, like this is probably 4,000 acres ish here. You could split this in half and put a couple thousand acres over here and a couple thousand here, and then these peas would be split out from the peas up on that other farm. Does that make sense, kind of? So we still get a big enterprise unit discount, the same discount, but it splits it up in my policy or whatever. So. Did you hear some ch check these specific rules? Only ASCII kind of resistant varieties are insurable, which is pretty much every variety they sell from what I found anyway. I have never seen one that was susceptible to ASCII kind of varieties. And then the seed must be treated with a recommended fungicide to prevent ASCII kind of blight. So if you don't treat that seed and you just put it in the ground, it's not insurable. Right? Plus, you can't just put Apermax on there because Apermax alone isn't labeled for ASCII kind of or it wasn't allowed in the chain. They did get rid of this requirement, which is a really good thing. So if the grower chooses to plant their own seed or bin run seed, it used to be that you had to send it into a seed lab and get it tested. If it came back with more than 0.3% ascochyta, it wasn't insurable. People would forget to do that, right? Then you get to a claim, and then it was a big mess. And so I think they realized that just was not something that was realistically possible to police and stuff. And so they got rid of that rule, which is a really good thing to keep you on the seed. And then if that kind of light damage occurs in the field, you must prove that you tried to spray it to control it. If you didn't go up with something on top, then it's going to be uninsurable when they were defined. <coughs> Most of the reason, that's why almost nobody can grow organic chickpeas in a churn, at least, right? Because we can't satisfy either one of those rules in organic. So, so these approved large kabuli chickpeas, if they're not on this list right here, they're not considered large for the insurance. If they're not large chickpeas for the insurance, your guarantee is going to change, like in that area of five from 360 bucks down to 260 probably. So it's a pretty big deal when you pick varieties out if you want that big guarantee. Make sure it's on this list, right? It used to be that we could send some paperwork into the government and ask for some of those other varieties to be added, kind of temporary, or they would just approve them as large as on aside from this list. But we can't do that anymore. They, they took that away from us. So. If it's not on that list, they're not large. They'll be classified as small for the insurance. And Corey, on that, if you, if you got CSP, when you send them in for Ascochyta, you also need a purity test on that. Oh, okay. Otherwise it, is, otherwise it goes against you, CSP. Oh, so CSP requires a purity test. Oh, so like Roger said, if you keep your own seed, you have to send Yeah, it. if you seed your own seed, you okay. usually got to send it to the lab in Bozeman. Right. And I just send it in for Ascochyta. Well, when it comes to the meeting the CSP requirements, they also need want a purity, purity on that. To tell how much of it actually is that exactly. variety of chickpea or whatever. Well, wheat, tree, whatever. Right, okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you don't have to do it for us anymore, but you might for CSP. Another question I have, Corey, is uh, using plant back data from uh, chemical resist or residual chemicals and whatnot, sure. do they uh, just use plant back? Oh, sure. So his question was like, as far as the plant backs on the label, you're talking about the crop insurance or aspect, yeah. and whether they'll pay it, right? right. He wanted to know if they just use the data from the labels or if they use other means. I, I've never seen them ever even with the label up, unless it's pretty obvious that something happened, right, in that field in just one spot. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I guess. Have you kind of run into well, that? Well, no. It's just a concern. We have right for years. We've had. Oh, right. That obviously may be drug that yields up. Right. And that happens all the time. The problem is the adjusters have no idea what happened. Unless it was, it's, it's the same thing happens with the Ascochyta thing. 95% of the time, the adjuster is not going to know that's probably what the problem was, unless all the fields around it did really good and that one did. Which would be the same thing with the chemical, right? right. So, but I've never, to date, had a claim denied because of some sort of chemical problem yet, I guess. Good question. Though. It's all the rules that that would be an issue, but I've never seen it happen. So, so cover plot guidelines, you have to terminate that 90 days prior to planting. The most important part of that is if you're doing winter wheat, probably, right? So, they don't see the, if you see the cover crop and you let it grow until August and terminate it and seed that winter wheat in September, is that 90 days? No, right? So, you need to go get a statement from Kim. I'm going to be one of the experts. Hey, it was okay to do that. And then maybe from your agronomist. 
Okay, both those guys will tell you it's okay. You just gave it a 30-day break, and then you see the winter weed into it, then it's insured. If you don't take those steps, and they find out that you're out of compliance on that, it would be uninsured. Once again, there's kind of a policing issue in here too with the adjusters, right? But it could be a problem, so make sure you do that correctly. So, so this is just comparing our wheat premiums from one year to the next. I, I went like Tool and Glacier County. These should be pretty comparable throughout all our counties as far as how the loss ratio is worth it. And this will help you guys kind of pick. You're going to see that most everything's about the same from what it was in 2017 and 2018. So if you're kind of happy with how you're set up, we can leave it the way it was. But in 2017, so this is summer, fall, and spring wheat in Tool County, your underlying premium and enterprise units on that would have been 391. Now it's 396. So it went up just a little bit. And then the SEO went from 292 up to 330. That's because SEO had a lot higher loss ratio than the underlying stuff did. So that SEO went up a little bit. All in all, we're not looking at a 5% difference, right, as far as wheat goes. Let me go to, here's wheat enterprise versus optional units. A lot of guys will keep their wheat in optional units just because it's not super expensive. And then they don't have to buy as much annual insurance on it, so that's one thing to think of. But in optional units, this wheat in Tool County is $11.61. Enterprise units goes down to 4 bucks, though. So you can see there's a big difference, right? And the SEO is the same premium if you guys enroll in that, whether you're an enterprise or optional, because their risk isn't any higher either way. So, so it's about half the price if you put it together in enterprise units if you want to something like that. And then barley, this is with a five dollar malt contract. It actually went down from 2017 into 2018 by about 50 cents here. So it went from 650, I guess, down to 630, so about 30 cents. And then the SEO part actually went down a little bit too. So all all that if you do SEO all that together, it's about a 50 cent drop this year on barley with the same contract price. So that's all good news. Most of that didn't blow up a lot. And then barley, here's enterprise units versus optional with the malt endorsement. If you do the malt endorsement, it's really expensive if you put it in optional units. So most people will do enterprise at that point. You can see it's 15 bucks in optional and only five bucks in the underlying premium for enterprise units. So it's a third of the premium on that to put it all together in one pot. So that's why most barley guys end up, if you're going to do the malt endorsement, end up doing enterprise units. And put ale insurance on for the state. <coughs> These large kabuli chickpeas, we already went through that basically, but um, this isn't a year on year thing, but it's going to be pretty much what I showed you on that last slide. So there's a couple things we need to review because you guys got these postcards, right, saying that YC is available this year for the first time or whatever. Um, so there's two options that are on pretty much every crop on your sheets that you have there. If you look at your quote sheets, on the top right part of your quote sheet, it'll tell you what options you have on all these crops. I think, too. YA just means yield adjustment. Every crop that we have, usually we'll leave that on. That means that in any given year, if you have some poor yields, it'll bottom out at 60% of the county average for what they use for that.